Hey everyone, this is Alex. Just wanted to give a quick disclaimer up off the top of this episode. On the show today, we are going to be covering some sensitive issues uh, like suicide, though as we'll discuss a little bit further in the episode, the kind that we are talking about bears some important differences from other forms of suicide and self-harm. Still, if this topic makes you uncomfortable, we would recommend skipping this episode. We'll also put some resources in the show description that you might find useful if you or someone you know is in crisis. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Reverb. My name is Alex Helberg, and I'm joined on the mic by my co-host and co-producer, Calvin Pollock. On the morning of February 25th, 2024, Aaron Bushnell, a 25-year-old service member of the U.S. Air Force, posted a link to his Twitch channel on Facebook, commenting, quote, Many of us like to ask ourselves, what would I do if I was alive during slavery, or the Jim Crow South? or apartheid? What would I do if my country was committing genocide? The answer is, you're doing it, right now. Several hours later, around 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Bushnell live-streamed himself walking toward the Israeli embassy in Washington, D.C., carrying a metal bottle without a lid. Bushnell recorded himself saying, I am an active duty member of the United States Air Force, and I will no longer be complicit in genocide. I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what people have been experiencing in Palestine at the hands of their colonizers, it's not extreme at all. After setting up his camera several feet away, still live streaming, he poured the liquid from his bottle over his head and lit himself on fire from his feet, shouting, free Palestine, over and over with increasing agony. Bushnell's act of protest is the second nationally documented instance of self-immolation in response to the ongoing Israeli war in Gaza over the past several months, as of the time of this recording. In December, a protester, who the media has refused to name, set themselves on fire outside the Israeli consulate in Atlanta, Georgia, while holding a Palestinian flag. To help us think through this Flashpoint event, we are joined by Dr. James Chase Sanchez, Associate Professor of Writing and Rhetoric at Middlebury College. James is an eminent scholar on the rhetoric of racism and white supremacy, as well as social movement rhetorics that have emerged to counter these forces. He is the author of two books, the co-authored collection Race, Rhetoric, and Research Methods, and Salt of the Earth, Rhetoric, Preservation, and White Supremacy, both published in 2021. He is also the producer of an award-winning 2018 documentary titled Man on Fire, which tells the story of 79-year-old Minister Charles Moore, who set himself on fire in protest against racism in his hometown of Grand Saline, Texas. James, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Excellent. Well, so I I issued a little bit of a disclaimer right at the top of our show today that we would be covering some sensitive issues on this episode. Obviously, we are talking about the self-immolation of Aaron Bushnell in protest of the ongoing violence in the Israeli war on Gaza. But we also talked a little bit about the fact that self-immolation as a form of public protest bears some important distinctions from other forms of suicide and conversations about self-harm. So I think it's important to address this question first. Why are we talking about self-immolation as a different kind of action than suicide as it is traditionally medically or legally defined? Yeah, thanks for that question. And I I think it's really important to name because for a lot of people, and I I think there's a split in audiences here, right? And so I, I assume a lot of people who listen to this, who are probably in the United States, right? And so when we think about death in this capacity, we often think of it in terms of suicide, right? This question is why would someone end their life for whatever reason? And often it gets into discourses of mental illness. And, you know, I, I would like to say here at the beginning that obviously I'm not an expert in, in psychology or a therapist or, or anything along those lines. But self immolation stands out because it typically, and in doing my research for my, my dissertation, what stood out is 
generally speaking, people who commit suicide for non-protest means, it's a very private act. It's not something that is typically done out in the open. And I think we as rhetoricians understand that there's a difference between, you know, the private and public lives, right? That we, we do things, we act differently in private than we do in public. And so for one, self-immolation, you generally never hear of a self-immolation being a private act, right? It's generally done out in the open. Sometimes there, most times there is an audience, be it Charles Moore and Grant Saline in my hometown, be it Thich Quan Duke, Saigon, 1963, Muhammad Bozizi in Tunisia, or even Aaron Bushnell's recent self-immolation. But even ones that are a little bit more private, like David Buckle and Prospect Park in 2018, he, he chose, he deliberately chose to go out early in the morning. I believe it was on a Saturday, maybe in a Sunday morning. He, he deliberately chose a time where people wouldn't witness it. He didn't want that trauma. I, I think he was very explicit in not wanting that trauma, people witnessing it. But he wanted it to be a public act, right? Because the public is where that protest comes in. You couldn't really protest something in, in private. And so I think there's a split here in how we think about suicide and self-immolation that in a lot of the discourse I've been reading, be it on social media, et cetera, has been left out. I think we get into conversations about mental illness and we get into conversations about not quote unquote glorifying the act, but we're moving past what would lead someone to, to commit such a, for many of us, which is an unthinkable act. And I think that the self-immolation act itself should be a cause for us to move towards empathy and not just move towards or move away or just dismissing the act itself. So it, it is quite a bit different. And for the most part, I, I one research bit that came out in my, in my dissertation, and I haven't looked um, so much over the past few years, like really looking at self-immolation, when someone has lit themselves on fire, around the world, it's very explicitly tied into protests. They have notes they left behind, they have letters, they have things saying exactly why they're doing this as an act of protest. And that stands out, of course, from from other acts of, of self-harm. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, James. I think that's a really good summary of kind of the distinction between self-immolation as a public rhetorical act and suicide as a medical or legal issue. I think we wanted to home in next on some of the other rhetorical dimensions of this act. And I, and I guess how I wanted to frame this question is that in preparation for this conversation, I was watching Man on Fire and, and reading your book, Salt of the Earth. And one of the things that really stood out to me about the case of Charles Moore is that he had been reacting to a whole background of prior rhetoric, right? And and that seems to be so important to what distinguishes this rhetorically, right? Is not just the act as a singular node, but the broader rhetorical ecology that it exists within and, and the prior rhetoric. And so I wonder if you could talk first about the case of Moore and, and how you saw that as shaping what he did and and how you think about that in comparison to Aaron Bushnell. Yeah. So uh, Charles Moore self-immolated in, in my hometown on June 23rd, 2014. So we're almost a decade away, which seems so it just that seems impossible, honestly, yeah. saying that loud. And, you know, just a little background here. I was already like studying protest act and really wanted to write a dissertation on protests and self-sacrifice and protests. And I was interested in Thich Quan Duke and Tank Man and at Tiananmen Square and other things in this act of, of self-sacrifice. And so when Charles Moore self-immolated in my hometown, like it just, it was one of those moments I feel like we all have in our lives where you sort of get the chills. And, you, and I knew that if there was a story I had to tell in my life, it was this story because it was so uniquely tied to place and home and issues of race and racism. So I was immediately drawn into Charles Moore's Self-Immolation Act and, and wanting to better understand it. Yeah, I, I think what you were just naming, Calvin, in terms of his connection, his explicit connection to what it is that he was doing, he left a folder for his wife to find that he didn't leave behind like a note per se to his family. He left them directions in terms of 
his funeral arrangements. He left a note to Grant Celine that was very explicit saying, oh, Grant Celine, repent of your racism. And it was about a page and a third or so naming historical references of racism in town and, and calling for people to change and, and to ask for forgiveness for the town's historical racism. But in the inside of this folder he left for his family, on page one, you open it up and it was an image of Bitcoin Duke, self-immolation, very famous image, one of the most famous images of the 20th century, I would say, on fire where you have tranquil sort of Bitcoin Duke who looks tranquil and peaceful, but of course we have the violence of the flame. And then the image next to it was, he was a Methodist minister, a retired Methodist minister. So we had the Methodist cross with the flame that is sort of encircling the cross. And so to me, it was clearly, he, he was sort of uniting this as a theological stance, right? Like the, the idea of the fire and both of them and that he was sacrificing himself for a cause. And in his notes, he had a couple of articles and they're both looking at the recent upwave in the 20, early 2010s in Tibet, which Tibet had about over a period of five or six years, I think in the 2010s, like 150 to 200 self-immolations in protest of the Chinese rule over the Tibet autonomous region. And he didn't have notes scribbled out in this. He didn't really have many things underlined. But I remember this passage, and I'm going to butcher the phrase, uh, the the quote. I don't have it in front of me, but it was something in reference to, to give up your life for a cause isn't a paradox because your life is precious in saving others. And to me, that just encompassed exactly Charles Moore's mindset and in going into what he wanted, what he, he was trying to do in Grand Celine. And in the, in the article, A Terrible Act of Reason, he had another one highlighted that said uh, an article that our, I posted a screenshot of it recently on Twitter saying that it, it's sort of an utterly humane act to self-immolate. And it's a terrible act of reason is what Timothy Dickerson, a scholar out of D.C., has named, has referred to as self-immolation because it's it's an act bearing out humanity in some capacity, right? It, it sort of goes deeper than we can imagine in a lot of other protest acts. And so all this to say, Charles Moore sort of spelled out his reasons and was tied to the history of self-immolation as this act of protest. And I, there's still news coming out from Bushnell's self-immolation. And so I, I want to follow that closely and then see what, you know, what else comes out. But it was very clear to me that Moore was doing it as act of solidarity for the Black community. And I think we could say that Bushnell was doing the same thing in terms of an act of solidarity for, for Palestine and, and Gaza. But uh, I think place also matters here, right? In a way that outside the Israeli consulate, right, you, you're saying, sending a message of almost saying the blood is on your hands. And I don't know if Charles Moore's act, if I would say it's that directed in terms of like blood on your hands while he's saying he's trying to get these people to ask for forgiveness. So it's a little bit less charged, I feel like, than Bushnell's act. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to say that both of these are the same act, right? The same amount right. of violence. But you could argue that Bushnell's act is a little bit more violent because I would say he is pointing the finger at Israel and saying, you must act. The blood is on your hands. So... Right. Uh, quite a bit of similarities, but um, maybe the connection to history is is a bit different from what we have, from the information we have right now. The the one thing I wanted to pick up there, just as a follow up, in in the book, I know that you talk about like three different rhetorical strategies of white supremacy, and when, a key one there is the rhetoric of silencing. And I wondered if you had any thoughts on that similarity potentially that there's a kind of rhetoric of silencing operating in these contexts that the act of self-immolation is a, an intentional effort to like puncture the silence right yeah one thing i often note and i know it came out in the this was named in the book as well but probably it wasn't a focus is that self-immolation calls you in right with charles moore so many people said like why if he really cared about this why not have a sign why not march up and down the street there's so many ways that you could protest racism in grant Celine. and i think it's very fair and we can all say like 
was he misguided in his choices? And I think that's a very fair take to have uh, with Charles Moore. I think what you can't argue, though, is that the publicity, right? Like at the end of the day, self-immolation, all protests is about publicity, right? Trying to get eyeballs on whatever it is that's going on. And compared to any other protest act, I can imagine you are more drawn into the spectacle of self-immolation. Self-immolation commands us to say, whoa, what just happened and why did this person just do this act? Because at the end of the day, we all know giving up one's life for something like it, it makes us in the making man on fire. I constantly ask myself, is there anything I would self-immolate for? Is there any cause great enough for me? And I don't think I ever would say that I would, right? And so that really made me empathize with, with Charles Moore quite a bit more. And I think with Bushnell, right, it, it's very similar in that there's been so much discourse about over the last, gosh, what are we talking, almost five months now? Five uh, months. And, and what's going on with the war. I, I think so many Americans have become jaded to what's been happening, right, with uh, the genocide in, in Palestine that someone, in this case, felt like they had to try to puncture the discourse, right? So again, we can always say misguided. We can we can make a lot of evaluative terms when it comes to looking at Bushnell or more, but at the end of the day, they are trying to have us connect our humanity back to what it is that we're seeing or not seeing and trying to change the discourse, which is to me an altruistic act, even if there are maybe I would always say an ego has to be involved in the self-immolation act. There's no way for you to be like, oh, I want to give up my life for a cause and I think I'll make a difference, right? The ego has to be there. But I still think and I hope that altruism is at the end of the day, the, the primary focus. I, I hear you loud and clear on that. I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned in your previous response, specifically talking about one of the, I, I thought, kind of the most fascinating things about your documentary, which I rewatched in preparation for this episode, was how it captured the ways that an act like somebody setting themselves on fire as a protest action, making a public spectacle of their own frustration, allowed for you to really capture some really fascinating responses from the people in the community and kind of how they were trying to process, justify, cover over a whole variety of different rhetorical techniques that we could see them using. I think that's probably one of the most fascinating things about your documentary and one of the reasons I appreciate it so much, because it is really interesting to see the way that people are going to try in post, try to either valorize, justify, or in other cases, you know, say this was misguided. But I heard so many conspicuous echoes in your documentary of people talking about Charles Moore, of people bringing up mental health, people bringing up specifically, you know, the fact that, you know, he might have using all kinds of language that I don't necessarily want to repeat here about his, you know, basically mental faculties. Was he in his right mind when he was uh, conducting this action? And that has also been one of the more jarring observations to me, and I'm sure to you too, in the immediate wake of Bushnell's self-immolation, has been the way that commentators in the media sort of immediately jump to focusing on Bushnell's individual mental health, his political affiliations, his personal life, but really like that mental health crisis as being the real crux of this issue. So, for example, uh, the Slate writer Mark Joseph Stern uh, tweeted out, uh, quote, I strongly oppose valorizing any form of suicide as a noble principled or legitimate form of political protest. People suffering mental illness deserve empathy and respect, but it is wildly irresponsible to praise them for using a political justification to take their own life, end quote. So my question for you as somebody who has looked into a case like this pretty thoroughly, from your perspective, what does this kind of framing miss or occlude about Bushnell's actions, and what might be a more responsible way to frame and cover this event in the national news media? Yeah, you know, you're you're hitting on a really hot topic for me. I th I think uh, two things stand out, especially from the Stern quote, and I'd separate it between how we think of mental illness and self-immolation and this idea of valorizing. Hey, I really want to talk about both of those because, you know, I, I find what he sort of says, and I'm looking at the quote again, is sort of uh, interesting in that he says, I strongly oppose valorizing 
but these people deserve empathy. And I, I don't understand where he is. I think so much of this discourse around when people are looking at this act at Bushnell or, or anyone else and are looking at it with empathy, I think a lot of people take that as valorizing or take that yes. as people saying, hey, we everyone should just go and self-immolate for a cause. I, I don't think there's anyone who thinks that. I don't think anyone believes we should have tens hundreds thousands of more self-immolations no, no one wants that so to me I, I don't view it as valorizing i mean being on social media i haven't seen anyone who i thought was truly like valorizing in a way that seemed anything more than empathetic towards someone trying to give up their life for a cause i don't think anyone was calling for more self-immolations for instance well, and even if there were, I don't, I don't think that they were a loud voice in any, it was not a collective, like cacophony of voices calling for that, right? I mean, I, I guess what that's true of social media with anything, right? Like no matter what act or event, whatever situation takes place, of course, there's going to be a minority that does whatever it is that we believe maybe as a majority shouldn't happen. So yeah, maybe there were some, but it, it wasn't leading voices, I would say. And and I think people move into this idea of assuming valorizing because if people are okay with it or understand it, it the, for a lot of people, I, I really think in America, and, and I didn't talk about this earlier, there's a split to me and an American audience is different, right? I think in Tibet, for instance, even though the Dalai Lama and others are not necessarily in support of self-immolations. When self-immolation happens there, the discourse coming out isn't like, well, they're probably mentally ill or how dare we valorize someone given their life in protest of the Chinese regime. They understand it. It's socially accepted. And I think that we can empathize and we can have real conversations about it without getting into these binaries of it has to be all good or all bad or we're all valorizing it, or, you know, or whatever, however we want to split hairs there. And so in some sense, I, I think that's wrong, that we have to go into this binary. I think we can empathize without calling for more self-immolations or believing that anyone who dies as an act of protest is justified, because that's not true. But secondly, this idea of mental illness is, I really don't like this discourse for a couple of reasons. One is, even if someone has a diagnosed mental illness, for instance, and this is where I, I'll probably re-emphasize not an expert, can someone with mental illness not have agency over their life and their death in a way that they see fit in terms of trying to help the world? That, to me, suggesting that anyone who has mental illness doesn't have the agency is ridiculous. <laughs> And where does this discourse differ in terms of end of life care? I mean, where do we really want to draw this line if we're, if we're saying people don't have the choice here? People shouldn't have the choice. And of course, I, I want to have the caveat, like I'm not in, I assume people, audiences should understand. I'm not in support of people committing suicide, people choosing this death. Like it's not something that I want per se, but I believe everyone should have agency over their own lives, whatever that means for them individually. And if people need help, I hope people seek help. But, and so in one sense, I, I think that that sort of takes away agency from people, but I think there's a lot of assumption happening here as well. And I did see maybe on Twitter yesterday, someone tweeted and it's one of those where I'm like, is this even verified? And I haven't looked more into it that Bushnell's mom tweeted out or gave a quote that her son was mentally ill. And so everyone who's against the self-immolation using this quote to justify their value of, of why he was wrong. And I mean, that was the same thing that happened with Charles Moore is there's an assumption of, of you could not get to this act unless you were mentally ill. And I just don't think that that is true at all. I think human beings, rational human beings, can rationalize giving up their lives for many different ways, right? I mean, it's Christianity is birthed around this. And I know that may be sacrilegious to some to hear, but the idea of a human being giving up their life for something greater than themselves is central to so much of our popular fiction, so much of our media, our movies, our TV shows, our Christian Bible are built around this discourse. And so to me, that it's just 
to just assume that someone cannot rationalize this choice is dismissing it without really sitting with it. And Mark Joseph Stern, who, who you just quoted, and others, I think at the end of the day, that's where I see the split, is it's so much easier to just dismiss, to just, this is so uncomprehendable for me. I cannot understand what's going on, that this person must be mentally ill, and that people who accept this must be valorizing it, suggests to me that this person, this individual, can't actually sit with it and understand that there may be good reasons, whatever those reasons are. And actually, who are we to even decide what is a good reason? I was only going to follow up on that saying, I mean, first of all, that's like such a clear headed way of looking at this issue. And I really appreciate the perspective that you just gave us there. I also wanted to say, I mean, it's striking me now as like listening to you talk that all of this the fact that we are now having to go into this mode of like, are we valorizing? Do we justify? Are we calling for like, to me, it also seems like it is functioning as a way of changing the topic of the conversation yes. from what was his protest actually about versus whether or not like, how should we think about it? Because I, I think you're exactly right that it is easier to dismiss somebody based on these sort of like individual characteristics of their individual lives rather than this person being part of a larger collective system that is, you know, resulting in violence that's happening to many people in places that we can't really see except for on social media and mediated through other means. So, yeah, I just wanted to kind of add that too. I think I think that that method of kind of like distilling this down to like, it, no, it's just one individual's problem occludes this framing of the larger systemic issues that might even, right. if we are to accept that, like he did have mental illness, even if that was the case, like, are we living in a system that would produce that kind of reaction in somebody, I think is still a valid question to ask. <laughs> I, I, I want to follow up from that because what's really interesting is a lot of commentators to me, and, and I never like dug into the, the full history of this, so I can't truly tell you. And with any historical event, right, I don't think it's ever one thing happened and then everything changed from that, right? That sort of is dehistoricizing whatever reality is. But it, this makes me think of so many commentators when we think about the Arab Spring, Mohammed Bozizi, a Tunisian street vendor, did not have the means to like help his family even because of the oppressive regime and self-immolated sort of in protest of the, the police and uh, sort of also the government. So many commentators in 2011, when we have the Arab Spring, we have the upheaval, Tunisia, Egypt, other countries, like pinpointed it as this one person in Tunisia self-immolated and then we have a revolution in these countries. And so it's interesting to me that, and I wonder for someone like Stern or someone else, like what would they say about that? Because we're saying that don't valorize, but then we might look at a history, but like, oh, well, this one act like created revolution and created change. And so if a single person can use their body to create change, who are we then to judge how that person uses their body, right? Because I do think at the, I don't want to say Mohammed Bozizi self-immolating absolutely caused the Arab Spring. I think that, again, that that would be a little bit too much, but you can find plenty of articles that would suggest that. But it, it definitely added a voice to it. It definitely lended a hand in, in leading towards revolution. And so if we allow ourselves to believe that individuals do have agency for changing the entire world around them, then I think we can look at self-immolation and move past just this discussion of mental illness and thinking about justifying it or understanding it, even if we don't want to justify or quote unquote valorize. I think it's important that we understand it. Something that occurred to me while you were talking about the mental illness trope as well, in some sense, I think we could say this trope is a little bit ableist, right? Because it's assuming a certain political valence to mental disability and a certain mode of, as you were saying, exercising agency, that there's an irrational agency that we can attribute to people who are mentally ill, that people who are mentally ill are necessarily irrational in their political action. And I, I find that really disturbing now as I reflect on it more. And so I appreciate you flagging that 
I'll just ask if you have any more thoughts on that before I ask my next yeah. question. To me, if your immediate thought, audience member or anyone else is, this person must have mental illness, then that makes me question your level of empathy for individuals and how they act in the world. I think that is just the easiest answer. And it's a way, Calvin, you were talking about silencing earlier. I yeah. mean, Celine, that's immediately why they did it is I don't want to have to think about racism in my hometown. I have silenced any dissenters to racism in my hometown for decades, if not over a century. Therefore, I'm just going to dismiss this. And what's the easiest trope I can rely on? Mental illness, right? Because everyone knows that only, quote unquote, mentally ill people are the ones who ever killed themselves. And that is such a dismissive and totally ableist perspective to have, for sure. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to pick up on this this kind of, I would call it an internationalist versus nationalist way of thinking about what Bushnell did in this act. So there was this article that came out from a writer named Emma Title for the Toronto Star who wrote a critique of what she termed the left, kind of how the left was processing Bushnell's actions. And she wrote, quote, is it not possible, if not highly likely, that both things are true, that Bushnell was outraged by death in Gaza and mentally disturbed? For while most of us are outraged by war, we do not set ourselves on fire to protest it, least of all when we live in a democracy. Aaron Bushnell was not a Tunisian fruit vendor living under the thumb of a dictator. He was a man living in a nation with a free press that allows numerous forms of protest. And it is frankly sick that leftists who live in free societies themselves have chosen to characterize Bushnell's death as glorious rather than profoundly tragic, unquote. And so I guess I'm just curious for your response to these critiques from title, like this, this rhetoric of democracy, free press, and free societies, I think is really, is really jumping out here, right? Yeah, that's such a, I mean, to me, it's a bullshit answer, because I think let's, let's change the variable, right? So we're saying this if, if, about self-immolation, and self-immolation, again, I, I think we would all agree, is the most extreme, one of the most extreme versions of protest, dependent on how you define protest. So if we change the variable and say, we're not talking about self-immolation, but we're talking about a hunger strike or something else that's an act of solidarity. The rest of the argument could be about any act of solidarity and say, well, you live in a free country, you have a democracy, you have a free press that allows numerous forms of protest. Like, how dare you go on a hunger strike? How dare you do this? How dare you do that? The only variable that has changed is that it's something that we in society cannot accept is giving agency to someone to live and die on their own terms. And even then, again, I, I always think about, and we're, we sort of been talking about this, and I want to move the needle, but I'm not, I'm not calling for everyone should have agency to just die whenever they want. That's not what I'm saying. But we already have this discourse, right? Like I think of palliative care and we have already in states are thinking about when someone has a terminal illness, don't they have the agency to decide when they should die? And there are people on different sides of this and we can have good debates about it. And I can understand why people maybe differ. But to me, that extends to all humanity, right? Like all acts of solidarity are important. And when we live in a democracy, when I'm thinking of self-immolation in particular, I don't think any of us who have lived in the United States our entire lives can truly fathom, truly, we can see the images, we can see the videos out of Gaza and Palestine, we can see all of this, but we can't truly understand. And with that said, this is an act of solidarity that is attempting to have us better empathize with and better understand what is going on there. And to me, it is just so... I think ridiculous to say that this shouldn't be allowed in a democracy when it's not about our democracy, it's about somewhere else. That argument, the logic in that argument is dismissive against all protest of solidarity. Because if we live in a democracy, well then should you never do an act of solidarity with anyone else is what that argument would be would be telling me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I just wanted to highlight as well 
that we have to remember that this is occurring in a context of a white supremacist democracy. Like, uh, like it's not a complete description of America, of the, of the American political system that Bushnell was acting within to just refer to it as a democracy with a free press, right? And so I find that comparison to Tunisia extremely striking that it's this kind of nationalist tapering over of all of the problems with our democracy here, right? And that seems really essential to that argument. And to me, it also is, you could make the argument, I don't know if I want to say I'm making this argument or not, sure. but I can make the argument rhetorically speaking that that makes this more powerful. This is someone who hasn't lived in this experiences, but has so much empathy and is trying to create so much change without fully understanding it that they're willing to give up their life and to have others try to empathize and try to create change within a society that many people, if not most people, don't care or are turning a blind eye to or however we want to frame that. Without experiencing that, there's someone who is willing to give up, you know, what we view as the the ultimate, their life for it. And so to me, you, you can make an argument that that is even a that solidarity act is even more powerful because it is coming from an inexperienced perspective. Yeah, I think that point is really well taken. And I I wanted to pick up again on, on something else that you said in your uh, response, because again, we, we're kind of moving back to this sort of like, you know, are we valorizing, are we glorifying this as a form of protest? And viewing it as through that lens of solidarity, I actually think is really quite useful here, right? And thinking about this kind of form of protest as a form of showing solidarity by bringing you know, imperial violence, which many people in the U.S., you know, and I mean, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, like people in the U.S. are probably relatively lucky to not have experience, not everybody certainly, but, you know, many of us have not experienced, as you said, the same level of uh, oppression and violence that people in Gaza and in Palestine more broadly have. And in a way, I mean, the way that I reacted to Bushnell's protest, just to bring myself into it, I also am somebody who considers myself in solidarity with Palestinians, in solidarity with their plight. But I was horrified watching that self-immolation. And to be quite honest with you, I I think that that was probably part of Bushnell's point, at least if we are to believe what he said as he was walking up to the gates of the embassy, which is that... I'm going to be engaging in a, an extreme form of protest, but this is what the ruling class in the U.S. has determined is normal, right? This is not actually extreme in comparison with what people in Gaza are experiencing. The only other thing that I wanted to highlight there, too, Eric Baker had a really good article in N Plus One that had what I thought kind of formed a nice rejoinder to the to the Emma title uh, passage that Calvin just quoted from. And it's this, quote, but the purpose of lighting yourself on fire is not to encourage other people to light themselves on fire. It is to scream to the world that you could find no alternative and that in and in that respect, it is a challenge to the rest of us to prove with our own freedom that there are other ways to meaningfully resist a society whose cruelty has become intolerable. And towards that end, this is the, the last question that we have for you is, is it possible to understand Bushnell's act of self-immolation as a fitting response in that kind of classic Lloyd Bitzer sense to this rhetorical exigency, to this broader social and political condition of hegemonic U.S. military and political support for this ongoing war in Gaza? And if so, how can we move away from either valorizing or condemning using this kind of evaluative language about the act itself to understand uh, and develop a compelling contextual explanation of its significance as a rhetorical strategy? So two things really stand out in my mind. Um, one is going to this sort of exigence that comes to me from the chaos of de dehumanization. And second, I think, is the sort of rhetorical appeals that are embedded within the Self-Immolation Act and how that tries to promulgate a response. So I'll start there, right? So for any protest act, and I, I teach at Middlebury College, I teach a course in protest, and I often talk about there are extreme measures that for any purpose of protesting, you could take to the extreme. 
but generally you don't want to go to the extreme at the very beginning because sometimes i often have like 18 19 year olds and they're they're ready to take over the president's office and i'm like well you there's steps that need to be followed before then right and we say that because generally speaking uh, an extreme act is going to receive extreme responses but it's also supposed to be jarring to us it is supposed to wake us up from our slumber it's supposed to have us look and say, oh my gosh, I have to do something about this. There's so much chaos in the world that we're looking for these momentary stays against confusion, I think is what Robert Frost once referred to as a, a, an ending of a poem. But to me, I find that self-immolation is trying to do the same thing. It is trying to take us out of our understanding of the world around us and make us be aware of what we aren't doing anything about, right? There's that difference between being convinced of something and being persuaded to act and create change. And so many of us are probably convinced that there is genocide or that there's so much wrong being done in, in Gaza, but then what are we actually doing about it? And I think that question is a fitting response for why self-immolation is understandable because it is trying to prompt people to respond. On the other hand, though, it's just this idea of dehumanization, that we have the rhetorical context of when people are dehumanized so much and so often over and over and over and over, we get to a point where we almost lose the, the humanity within ourselves, right? We, we can't understand besides our, we go about our daily lives, we have our daily routines of what it means to go to work, what does it mean to have free time on the weekend, et cetera, et cetera. And we move past this understanding of ourselves as bodies with, you know, some consciousness, et cetera, inside. And so I think that the rhetorical act also fits because it calls us to our humanity. By giving up one's life, we're supposed to see the humanity that exists within all of us. And as an act of solidarity, we say, look at these thousands, tens of thousands of lives that are affected and I've just been sitting in my room. I'm just sitting at home. What am I doing? How can I create change? Here is someone doing what is almost unthinkable to me to try to create change. So what can I do to be a part of this effort as well? And, you know, I think at the end of the day, its significance is important because it has historically been a very powerful protest act. Like JFK referred to the image of Thich Quan Duke as something like the most powerful image in the 20th century up to that point. It, it prompted an emotional response from John Neff Kennedy looking at this image of Thich Quan Duke. Charles Moore, for people of that scene, it didn't like change the collective at Grand Saline, but it made many people reflect and think about how race and racism are enacted within the town so that we know that this allows people to reflect and go inward and maybe want to create change it has done so historically and so for that i think that it is a very significant rhetorical act yeah that's fantastic i i just the one other similarity that i wanted to highlight to take it back to your work on charles moore i think it's really striking that Charles Moore was intervening in a situation. I mean, you mentioned that it didn't really change the culture of the town, his act. And I think part of why that is, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, was that like white supremacy has operated there for so long that it almost like you don't have to be openly white supremacist to achieve that goal of like there are no black people in this town. Black people feel unsafe in this town and they won't come through. And so it's kind of already won. And his was an act of despair of saying, like, there's nothing else I can do than this, right? And I thought that, I mean, in, in certain ways, that's what Bushnell's act is telling us as well, is that we're fortunate enough to have Palestinian members of Congress right now, like Rashida Tlaib from Michigan. And they are being censured by the Congress, like for trying to speak out rather than turning to those people and saying, how can your perspective inform more rational policy on Palestine and Gaza? We're censuring them and trying to get them thrown out of Congress, right? And so this is an act of despair where I guess we could call it anti-Palestinian racism or you know, the ideology in the US that justifies policies towards the Palestinian abroad have, have 
one, like they're so hegemonic that there's no room for agency other than these extreme acts. And I thought that when I was reflecting on the case of Charles Moore, I thought that that was a really interesting parallel. Yeah. And one thing I was going to add on to that real quick is in the United States, there was two in 2016, two self-immolations to protest the inauguration of Donald Trump. There was David Buckle, which received a little bit of news, this one in Atlanta, as you're naming. And it's hit or miss in terms of getting publicity. So we say all this to say it's easy to rationalize what Bushnell did, but you know, here we are today talking about it. And this act, even the one that happened a few months ago, didn't really receive much press, but there's been a lot of press about this, right? What everyone who is saying like, we shouldn't valorize this, we shouldn't whatever, are again, promulgating his message in some sense and having others sort of come through and have a discussion about it. So the spectacle of the act, what draws us in, in some sense is already working because we're having this conversation. I still don't understand why some get promulgated and we, we hear about it and it becomes a, a wave in the news media and others don't. And maybe it's just a chirotic moment of, of different variables that I don't fully understand. But this one hit in a way that I don't think another self-immolation that has happened in the United States has in, in a way that the discourse that even David Buckle, not Charles Moore, has. And so to me, that is a good thing. Even if we want to criticize uh, Bushnell, whatever your take is, it's prompting us to have conversations and to think about something needs to be done, which was overall what Bushnell wanted. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's very well said. Something that's shaken us out of our complacency, if we were complacent at this point, has at least invoked new conversations where they were not happening before and forcing us to reflect a little bit on our own role in these ongoing conflicts. So we want to say once again, thank you so much, Dr. James Chase Sanchez, for joining us today, for having this conversation and for continuing these discussions as we move forward. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. From all of us here at Reverb, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening and participating in this conversation with us. We will come at you with more Reverb again soon. Take care, Talk everybody. To you soon. Bye-bye. Our show today was produced and edited by Alex Helberg and Calvin Pollock. Reverb's co-producers at large are Ben Williams, Sophie Wadzak, and Olivia Burnett. You can subscribe to Reverb and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Android, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our website at www.reverbcast.com. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at ReverbCast. That's R-E-V-E-R-B underscore C-A-S-T. If you've enjoyed our show and want to help amplify more of our public scholarship work, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice and tell a friend about us. We sincerely appreciate the support of our listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in.